For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. This passage from Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is a precious promise to believers in Christ. It shows that we are not saved by our own good works, nor can we be. It is a gift of God that Jesus paid for with his blood for all of us. This is the uniqueness of Christianity. It is unique from every other religion because all religions besides biblical Christianity, and that includes Catholicism, they all depend on earning your salvation or promotion uh, through one's own good works. So this is a precious promise. But after that, believers often have a question, or there is the question, well, can I lose my salvation? If I have come to this place and God has so blessed me, can it be taken away from me? So I'd like to look at some scriptures with you to so that you can see how God feels about these things. One of the most precious scriptures that I can think of is found in Romans 5, verses 8 through 10. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And what this passage tells me is that, you know, Jesus died for us while we were yet in sin. When we were still rebels, we wanted nothing to do with him. And so if he died for us while we were in that state, then we have come to salvation. We've repented of our sins. We've asked for forgiveness for Jesus' sake. Now we are his. How much more difficult is it going to be to escape the Lord if he pursued after, after us in the way he did when we were still sinners? And even from the same chapter of Romans 5, from verses 1 and 2, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. In other words, we still have that. Jesus is our advocate, and he always will be. He would stand there for us in the same way that he received our repentance. He will receive it again. And even sometimes if we are not aware, once in a while I would hear a person say, but what if I did something and, and I didn't know I did wrong and, and I didn't repent? Well, the Bible is very clear in passages such as uh, John 9, 41, that we are not held accountable for sins done in ignorance. Once they, are once they come to light, then we repent of them, and ask the Lord to help us to avoid them in the future, and we move on. Ours is a, is a faith of growth in our relationship with the Lord. As we also see in precious passages here, again, Romans is such a wonderful book. We look to chapter 7, I'll start with verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Before I go on, remember that the Lord is having Paul write this, he is already a Christian, and he's writing this to Christians, as in all of these epistles of the New Testament are written to Christians. Back to verse 19. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the, serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation, to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So you see, this is a precious, precious passage. It just identifies how we will stumble even during our years that we are still here in the flesh. What can we do? But we thank God that Jesus is still our advocate, and his blood 
will still cover our sins. I'd also just like to go over. It is from 1 John. It's a well-known passage. 1 John 1, 8 through chapter 2, verse 2. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate, advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world, as many as would put their trust in him. So these are precious promises that we have to lean on. And so you can see that if you have come to, to salvation in Christ by grace, and he reached out to you while you were a sinner, he's not going to, he's not going to be quick to let you go. And as a matter of fact, what happens is many people say, okay, can I lose my salvation? I say most definitely you cannot lose your salvation as if it is some accident, but you can choose. You can choose against it. You can choose things that are going to compromise it. Some people don't like to hear that. I know that. But I'm going to read this from 1 Timothy 4.1. Because you see what happens is then Satan has to deceive you into making bad choices. Things that will ultimately like deny Christ or you'll be comfortable in your own righteousness. You'll start believing in your own works rather than the grace of God. However it happens, there are some that fully turn away. Maybe by what they see in other professing Christians or whatnot, but they do turn away. Listen to this from 1 Timothy 4.1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Wow, right there it is, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And this is how we can choose against. And that is why there are so many there are so many uh, warnings in the scripture. Don't we have a lot of warnings about spiritual deceit? Don't we have a lot of warnings about what it means to deny Christ? Don't we have warnings even in Revelation 3 about being lukewarm toward God? And so with these warnings, we find little reassurance. Don't worry. It's okay. Even if you stumble and fall on your face, even if you deny me, even if you're deceived into another religion, I'll still take you in. There is nothing like that uh, that goes along with these things. We are in a relationship with Christ. He is not going to let us go. He is more faithful than any married spouse ever would be. As the word says, that if we are faithless, yet he abides faithful, for he cannot deny himself. I want you to remember that I have scriptures listed uh, in the description at the bottom. I also have a link to a blog that I have done about this. I was very thankful. I felt the Lord did uh, gave me a great approach on the blog, approached it as a letter to brethren in Christ. Uh, I really encourage you to look at this because even at the bottom, I mean, the scriptures of this are many. We are not going to lose our salvation. We have a way with the Father, you know, but we still have to choose and walk uprightly. One of the things that I hear many times is, I, I just wanted to get this out of the way. I hear this that people are saying, well, you can have eternal life now by trusting in Jesus. And that is not biblical. Okay, let me tell you what the Bible says. It's kind of obvious. We will not receive that gift of eternal life until after our bodies die. We do not have it at this moment. That should be pretty clear. But sometimes uh, people are being sold on the idea that they have it right now. In other words, and it can never go away. But listen to what the, what the word says here. This is from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 54. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed 
in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this incorruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. And we can see this again in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so, being that, if so that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought for us the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. That is, there is an evidence of the Holy Spirit in us. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. So eternal life does begin. It begins after the death of the body. It is something that I look forward to very much, and I hope that you are too. I pray that you are too. Try, pardon me for a moment. I'm trying to sort these things out. So I've had to keep this a little bit brief for YouTube, which is one, one reason why I like the blog on this better. But I wanted to present it to you. It's very, very important. Just to mention a few of these things. Uh, one of the scriptural mentions I can give by example, of course, is the Apostle Peter. We know that Peter denied Christ, and therefore he fell out of right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. This is addressed in Matthew 10, 33. This is where Jesus said, if you deny me, I will deny you before the Father. So we see in Mark 16, 7, where the angel is addressing, he says, go and tell the disciples and Peter. He separated Peter from the other disciples by how he addressed it. And in Luke 22, 32, he's talking, Jesus is talking to Peter directly saying, when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. So in other words, he knew that Peter was going to fall. And this is a great example for us because even though there's the possibility of falling, we also still have that, that mediator. We have that advocate with the Father that we can turn to. And many, including myself, have backslidden and have been returned by the grace of God into right standing uh, with the Lord. Another thing I would just mention is the churches of Revelation. Five of the seven churches in Revelation were told to repent or they were going to be under judgment. These things are very obvious. And again, we see in the parable of the sower, in the parable of the sower in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we see that there are occasions uh, the two middle seeds, the one in shallow soil and the one among the thorns, both of these fell, in, fell out of right relationship with the Lord. They turned away from the word. And so I just want to continue on here a little bit uh, for time's sake, not that anybody is pressing me, but I just wanted to give you a few examples from Scripture. It's very important. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves, and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which hath, which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own self shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. This was Paul writing this in the book of Acts. Guess what? Why is he warning them with tears night and day for three years? Okay, if they turn away disciples after them, they are turning away the disciples. So in my examples, of course, I have many scriptures that list spiritual deception as well, because this is a warning not to turn away from the Lord. 
Then we see this from Romans 11. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God, on them which fell severity. But toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. I don't think it gets much plainer than that. You know, it's a lot easier to take the Bible just the way it is written than to try to say, well, I don't believe this verse, I don't believe that verse, I don't believe this book is for somebody else. God has promised us eternal life. But, you know, Satan's going to try to steal it. Remember, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he has given lots of precious scripture promises to, to lean upon to resist him. From James chapter 5, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Even there from this scripture, one of, one of them would err from the truth and one convert him. In other words, he's backslidden and one comes back again. It gets to be pretty plain in scriptures like this. Here again, now we're going to go to 2 Peter chapter 2. And I love this whole chapter, but I had to cut it short a little bit. Uh, because of the time. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, these are false teachers he's referring to, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from those who live in error. They were clean escaped from those who live in error. They allure them. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. And my own thoughts here are the reason why it is worse with them than the beginning is because in the beginning they knew that they were sinners separated from God and they could seek him in that way to repent and to trust in Jesus. But when these false teachers come, they tell you that you can go back into the flesh. You can enjoy all of these fleshly things that God has said are evil. They're wrong. And they're still Christians. That's exactly what the false teachers will say. So it's worse for them because now they don't see their need for repentance. And also this from Revelation twenty two nineteen: If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. Say that again. God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So I think these warnings just by themselves, you know, they speak for themselves. But as Christians, when I see the promises that God has given, I mean, we have nothing to be concerned for. What we need to do is throw ourselves on the rock of Jesus Christ to be broken. We need to build our foundation on the word of God. As Jesus said in Matthew 7, verses 24 and 25. And I just urge you in this, because if you have been uh, swayed by that doctrine that says you have eternal life now, there's nothing, nothing else is going to come. Oh, my name is in the book of life. Everything's okay. Things like that. We are in a relationship with God. And that relationship has been identified as a marriage. And as I said, the Lord is more faithful than any earthly partner could be. But in that marriage, you can understand it's a, it's a relationship that goes every day and it's one of growth. We get closer and closer and more bound to each other. But we understand that if we don't take care of that relationship, something can happen. And it's not going to go, you know, it's not going to, I can't snap my fingers anymore. <laughs> it's not going to go like that. Okay, God will pursue after you. I know he pursued after me when I was backsliding. He did a lot of chastening of me, but I was so blinded by that time I couldn't see until his greater blow finally came to me. And so you can have a lot of confidence in the Lord, but I want you to know the truth of his word. Please, by all means, check out these scriptures listed in the description because there's about 90, 
Not 90 verses, 90 scriptures. This is not something I have come up with over a few scriptures here and there. God has you in his hand. Be encouraged and be strong in the truth of God's word. May God bless.